church calendar today we remember the martyrdom of John the Baptist and I think this is a the timing on this is is right because my heart breaks for many Christians who and and in Afghanistan had faced absolute horrendous future and uh, my heart breaks for them and, and I pray that we would all as the Christian church uh, be in prayer for them, do what we can to help. And uh, this is a very difficult situation, so our heart goes out to our brothers and sisters in Christ in Afghanistan. Uh, God is sovereign. God can work mi miraculous things in the midst of all of this. And we pray that people would repent and turn to Jesus, who is uh, the author and perfecter of faith. So. Please stand with me and we make our beginning in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Gracious Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your promises that are yes and amen that are found in Jesus. We do pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who face more than an uncertain future, a very horrendous future at the hands of, of people who want to do evil. We pray that you would protect them and watch over them and that they would be strong in their faith and their witness to you, the true and the living God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Our first reading comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth, fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading comes from the book of Romans, chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. This is this is the word of the Lord. And thanks be to God. Please stand for the reading of the gospel, the holy gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 14. The holy gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter, beginning at verse 14. And here we read the account of the martyrdom of John the Baptist, the beheading of John the Baptist. 
Let us read. King Herod heard of it. What did he hear of? He heard of the miracles Jesus did. For Jesus' name had become known. Some said John the Baptist had been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said he's Elijah, and others said he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military command commanders and leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. Uh, and the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, asked saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. The girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. This is the gospel of our Lord, and praise to you, O Christ. Again, my heart breaks for our brothers and sisters in Christ in Afghanistan who face tremendous opposition, persecution, and death at the hands of evil men. We want to lift them before God's throne of grace and remember that martyrdom is not something that we could, should seek out as Christians, but if it comes to us that we would have the strength to maintain our faith in Jesus Christ in the midst of persecution and opposition. Let's pray. God of grace and mercy, we come before you. We cry out to you. Lord of grace and mercy, please be with the people in Afghanistan. Please be with Christians, our brothers and sisters in Christ in Afghanistan. Watch over them, Lord God. Keep them in your care. Make them strong and bold in their faith, Lord God, in the midst of evil that is being done. Father God, in our own communities, in our own towns in which we live, help us to be bold in our faith, bold in proclaiming the truth of the gospel, bold in, in proclaiming who you are and what you have done, bold in proclaiming that our identity is found in you and in you alone. Lord God, we pray for that you would for the students on the campus of Penn State that walk with you, that know you, that there would be a light shining on the campus, Lord God. Work powerfully through them. Give them boldness of faith, Lord God, to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ, even when their friends would say, you know, what's wrong with you for following that, this, uh, this Jesus? What's wrong with you for following the words of the scripture? Lord God, give them strength to stand up for their faith in the midst of opposition. Father God, we ask that you would be with the leaders of this nation, Lord God, that they would humble themselves, that, Lord God, we deserve nothing but your wrath and condemnation, but we cry out to you for mercy, for grace, Lord God. We pray that we would repent and turn to you. We pray that the leaders of this nation would repent and turn to you, the true and the living God. God Father God, you have blessed us so much and yet we have frivolously used what you have blessed us with. Lord God, our greed has overtaken us. Help us, Lord God. Humble us before you, the true and the living God, that we be raised up to newness of life. I want to pray for marriages, Lord God, for strengthening of marriages, for blessing of families, Lord God. 
that you would be at the center of those the marriages, the center of families, Lord God. I pray for uh, single people, Lord God, that you would give them a, a, a sense of value and worth as they follow you, Jesus, that they know that they have a purpose, Lord God, and that they would use the time that you've given to them uh, wisely. Lord God, work through them as well, Father. We pray, Lord God, for the church in America. Lord God, for a church that is going astray, that the church would repent and turn to you, the true and living God. That we in the church, as your people, would repent and turn to you. That repentance starts with your people. Help us, Lord God. Humble us. Lift us up by your strong arm, by your mighty arm of salvation. Be merciful, Lord God. We cry out to you. Be merciful to this nation. We cry out to you. Be merciful, Lord God. We cry out to you. We look, we entrust our lives to you. You are the author and perfecter of our faith. So we pray these things, trusting in you, giving everything over to Jesus, who has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Okay.
Today in the church year, uh, in the church calendar, it's, it's a day that we remember the martyrdom of John the Baptist, as I said in the opening. And our text for today's message is based on Mark chapter 6, verses 14 and 29. So Mark chapter 6, verses 14 and 29. Let's, let's go before the Lord in prayer. Father, teach us, Lord God, even in the difficult things, difficult things of life, difficult things of opposition, of persecution. Teach us, Lord God, and help us to trust in you in the midst of all things. We pray this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So this, as I said, this Sunday in the church here is, is the day that we do remember the martyrdom of John the Baptist. And on the surface, that really seems like kind of a, a strange thing to commemorate or a strange thing to remember, a uh, strange thing to talk about. It's like almost like, hey, guys, come to church uh, to hear about someone uh, who was put to death for following Jesus. Hey, would you like to follow Jesus? Maybe it'll turn out a little bit better for you, but maybe not. Um, why does the church remember things like this? You know, why do we, we, why do we hold to these things? What can we take away from it and apply to our lives here and now today from this horrendous death of John the Baptist? What do we take away from it here in central Pennsylvania or wherever you're listening to this? <clears throat> what are the factors that led to John's murder at the hands of Herod? And are there any things that we can take away from that that we can apply to our lives, and maybe that there's factors, some same factors in existence today, even if it might not lead to our death. So first thing I want to talk about is what is martyrdom? Because I think there's a little bit of confusion about what martyrdom is. And in fact, uh, depending on what religion you follow, you may, there may be different definitions of martyrdom. Um, in some religions, for instance, maybe in, uh, for fundamentalist Islamists, martyrdom is something you would actually maybe even want to seek after. It's something of an, an honor to seek after martyrdom, to put yourself into that position. Uh, it becomes your honor to kill yourself for beha on behalf of God, on behalf of Allah, as they would say. And at times, we'd have to look back at our, the, uh, the history of the, of the Christian church. At times, the Christian church uh, held crusades in the past. And they were organized, and people offered their time, their money, and even their lives to recapture lands in the holy lands that had been taken over by Muslims. Is that martyrdom if you were killed in, in a crusade? The word martyr comes from the Greek word whose root it means to witness. And originally it was applied to the apostles who were witnesses to the life death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Later, it was used to describe those who were arrested and put on trial and for being followers of Jesus. A martyr is someone who suffers and dies for their testimony and their faith in Jesus Christ. It is not to be sought. It's not like we're supposed to go out there and say, yeah, Hope I, I get martyred this day. It's not something to be sought, but if it comes upon a person, it is to be endured in faith and in trust in Jesus. John the Baptist had martyrdom thrust upon him. For one reason, he spoke the truth. He spoke the truth about Herod and his marriage to Herodias who Herodias was married to Herod's brother, and then Herod took her to be his wife. That was not legal, a Jewish legal marriage. It's not legal today. It's really not legal today in the eyes of the church to do that. So John the Baptist called him out on that, 
Herodias hated John the Baptist for that. She wanted him put to death. She's the one that um, really forced the hand of her husband to uh, have him thrown into prison. So while, it, you know, there's a couple of things that we need to consider in on all this. It was holding to the truth of God's word that eventually led to John the Baptist's death. Therein lies a very important point for all of us, lesson for all of us in the times that we live in. Will we faithfully hold to the truth of God's word? You know, while we don't face death, at least not now, not in our location, not in our place, for holding the truth of God's word and for uh, maintaining our faith in Jesus, you will face opposition. That's the reality. If you're truly holding to God's word, you're going to face opposition in our culture. In human terms, though, you would think that God would want a faithful and zealous follower like John the Baptist to be around a, a bit longer. You think that God would swoop in and rescue John the Baptist from this imprisonment. Certainly at times, God does rescue his people from prison and from difficult situations. Peter and some of the disciples who were thrown into prison for following G for Jesus, Jesus. Paul and Silas were in prison singing hymns and a miraculous earthquake comes along, frees them from their chains and they are freed from his prison. But God did not rescue John the Baptist. Why? Does God not care about his people? And when we kind of start processing this, it becomes, can become troublesome to this. You know, for, for consider this. In just the last year, there have been over 340 million Christians living in places where they experience high levels of persecution and discrimination. 340 million. 4,761 Christians were killed for their faith just last year alone. 4,488 churches and other Christian buildings were attacked last year. 4,277 believers detained without trial, arrested, sentenced, or in prison. You know, this was laid out in the church calendar that I would be speaking on this, on this Sunday. And all of us are well aware of the horrendous events that have occurred in Afghanistan and the fact that our Christian brothers and sisters in Christ face death in the midst of what is going on in Afghanistan. Some have already died. So what is God up to in all of this? Was John's death in vain? Are one of our Afghan brothers and sisters in Christ who have been put to death, was their death in vain? Is their suffering in vain? Is the opposition you face as a follower of Jesus in vain when your friends look at you as out of touch? Maybe they don't want to hang out with you anymore. Let's look at the text and consider what people and Herod were saying about Jesus and then connecting, they were connecting that in their minds to possibly to John the Baptist. Let's see what the text says. It says, King Herod heard of it. In other words, heard of the miracles that Jesus was doing, heard of the miraculous signs and wonders that Jesus was doing. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are work in him. But others said he's Elijah, and still others uh, said he's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But listen to this. When Herod heard of it, what did he say? John, whom I have beheaded, has been raised. 
So Jesus is healing the sick, casting out demons, uh, demonic spirits, giving sight to the blind, doing all kinds of things. And the word of him, word of Jesus and what he's doing, makes it way, its way into the palace of Herod. What did the people think? Well, as we read, some thought that it could be John the Baptist come back to life. Others thought, well, maybe it's kind of a prophet in the line of Elijah or some of the prophets of old. Uh, Herod, though, sticks with the idea that it's John the Baptist who's come back from the dead. That's an important indicator that the life and death of John the Baptist has left an impact on Herod even from the grave still have any effect on him. When someone stands firm in the faith, in the midst of opposition, in the midst of, of physical abuse, in the midst even of torture, in the midst of being put to death for their faith in Jesus, it leaves an impression even on the person who was heaping the abuse on that person. Remember when Jesus died on the cross, when he breathed his last, and the Roman centurion, who had to be a hardened person, you're, you have crucifixion duty. You're used to seeing people being put to death in the torturous crosses that were there. And that Roman centurion, seeing the way Jesus died in, in his trust in the Father, seeing the way he breathed his last, that Roman centurion looks up and he says, surely this was the Son of God. The persistent testimony of, of, of a person that has everything to gain by compromise and yet remains steadfastly faithful, persistent in their trust in Jesus has a tremendous impact on even the most hardened of abusers. Herod, out of guilt or fear or both, is still being impacted by John the Baptist's life even from the grave. All of the original disciples, excepting John, not John the Baptist, John the disciple of Jesus, all of them were put to death for their, for their unwavering testimony that Jesus was who he said he was, the Son of God, who died and he rose again. And they proclaiming that in him alone there is forgiveness. They were martyrs. They were witnesses. Remember that the, the root of that word means to be a witness. They were witnesses and they couldn't deny what they saw in the life, the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's something very powerful about dying for your belief. But what makes their death, death different from, let's say, an Islamic fundamentalist dying for his faith. What makes it different? Consider this. There have been many people throughout all of history that have been put to death and have given their lives for something they believe to be true. But it wasn't true. They believed it to be true, but it wasn't true. What is different about the original disciples of Jesus is that they <coughs> died never giving up their testimony that they saw Jesus risen from the dead. Obviously, <coughs> they would have known that that was false if it didn't occur. They could have easily at any moment denied the resurrection of Jesus and spare themselves from the torture, spare themselves from the death that they would face. There are very few people in all of history that will die for what they know to be a lie. The disciples were in a position to know with what they were saying was either true or false. They held to it. All of them held to it, the testimony. The, word, the earliest witnesses died insisting that Jesus was risen from the dead. Something, obviously, they would have known to be false. 
if it didn't happen. Their martyrdom, their witness would turn the world upside down. They didn't die in, de- in vain. Now, while you and I aren't eyewitnesses of the resurrection of Jesus, we are witnesses of what he has done in our life and in the lives of people around us. Holding with conviction to Jesus and the word of God in our time will bring opposition upon yourself. You will face opposition. In a lot of cases, it may be peer pressure. It may be rejection by friends. It may mean loss of a job even in our culture loss of your ability to make a living in certain fields. And we may ask the question, how far, Lord? How far do you want me to go in following you? Prison? The grave? How far, Lord? Maybe... It's the wrong question. Maybe we have it turned around. The real question as you follow Jesus on the campus, in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family, is how far was he willing to go for you? How far was Jesus willing to go for you? The grave? Yes. Hell? Yes. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He's experiencing hell, the separation from the Father so that you and I would never ever have to experience separation from the Father. If he was willing to suffer and to go that far from you, do you believe that he really believe that following him, no matter where it leads, remaining faithful to him, no matter where it leads, will make your life worthless, a waste? Even if it means mocking, even if it means rejection by friends, even if it means opposition, and yes, even if it means imprisonment or death. He holds you. He's given everything for you. He's given his life over for you. And a life given over to him in return for what he has done for us by his grace is a life that is never lived in vain or a life that has never died in vain. Our heart breaks for those who faced opposition and even death for following Jesus even today in this day and age. But we know that their life has not been lived in vain and their testimony rises up their witness in their martyrdom rises up even from the grave even from the grave Jesus strengthen us for what is to come that we would follow you remain faithful to you in the midst of opposition Lord God, we don't seek martyrdom. We don't want to seek death. But we want to follow you. Wherever you lead, help us to trust in you fully and completely in all circumstances. And that our lives 
would reflect the grace you have poured out for us on the cross. You've given everything that we can have life. And a life held in your everlasting and loving arms is never a life lived in vain. Thank you for giving meaning and purpose to our lives. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Let us confess together our faith in the triune God and all he has done for us. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We have a, a time of confession before the Lord. And the Lord knows what's really on our heart. But what he's inviting us to do is come before him, be honest before him, come into his presence. Uh, don't hide anything from him. Run to him. It's a mistake for us to run from God. We should run towards him and confess to him. So let us, let's open our hearts and our minds to him. There'll be a time of silence as well that we can really pour out our hearts to God. So from... The words uh, from, the, from 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment in silence to reflect upon our need for Christ. So Lord, let us confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Hear the good news. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the gift of the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us for worship this day as we dug into this very difficult topic of, of martyrdom. And I, and I pray that God would give you strength to walk with him, to follow him, uh, to to put your trust fully and completely in him and to realize that he gave all for you and he holds you strongly in his arms. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen.